Well, hello everyone. Welcome to our quantitative history webinar. So today uh, our speaker is our own colleague, Professor Sung Yong Park. Uh, Professor Park uh, mainly works on labor education applied by micro. And now we are very happy to know he began to work on historical topics. So today he will present his very new paper uh, on the effect of, of religion on uh, state education in colonial period of Korea. Uh, today, we are also very happy to have uh, Professor Dol Kim as our discussant. Professor Kim uh, is an expert in Korean economic history, and uh, it's also the chairman, uh, the president of the Asian uh, Historical Economics Society. Sang Yong will give a one hour presentation followed by Professor Kim's discussion for about 15 minutes. And uh, lastly, we will turn to the Q&A from the audience. Well, Sang Yong, you, you can now share your screen to start the presentation. Thanks. Hey, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Chi Cheng. Um, so as Chi Cheng said, I, I typically work, uh, development economist, I work on field experiments, uh, interested in topics like agriculture and then education. Uh, but I was largely inspired by the fascinating work done by, uh, done by my colleagues at Hong Kong U, including Chi Cheng and also Zhu and others. So um, I decided that maybe I'll venture into this realm of, of economic history. And I always found uh, Korean history very interesting. Um, so that led to doing um, some projects. Um, so this is a, a second project that branched out from another project I started about three years ago. And um, this is actually my first time presenting this paper and also my first time presenting in a history um, seminar. So, um, you know, I might be missing something or uh, if there's anything to clarify, please feel free to um, put it in the Q&A or ask questions after the talk. Um, I'll be happy to uh, also answer any clarifying questions. Okay, so just a little bit of background about this paper. So this is a joint work with Yutaro Ijumi. Um, so Yutaro was originally working on a topic about the, um, the, the political protest in colonial Korea and how that might have influenced the education provision by the colonial government. And then I was also uh, working on, I was collecting this data set about on religious institutions in Korea and looking at how it influenced these uh, political movements. So we decided to combine our, our two different projects into one and, and hopefully try to provide some unified framework that can explain this uh, political uh, phenomenon that happened in, in colonial Korea. So this is at a very preliminary stage. Uh, we just barely uh, wrote our first draft or first version uh, of this paper. So uh, we would uh, be happy to receive comments, suggestions, also welcome for any uh, clarifications. Okay, so um, the big question that we have in mind for this project is how do religion and state interact? So there are many studies showing that both religion and states uh, and their institutions played very significant roles in human societies. For example, um, they had uh, influence on education, human capital accumulation, economic development, and also shaping cultural norms and values. Um, however, despite the importance of these two, uh, we think that there's limited quantitative evidence on how the two interact and how that shaped um, our societies. So with that question in mind, uh, this paper attempts to fill the gap by studying the role of religion in political mobilization. So how would religion uh, mobilize people to engage in political protest or political movements and how that would influence the state's policy on, for example, providing education or how they're going to expand their institutional capacity. So uh, the idea we have in mind for this paper is uh, religion can um, mobilize uh, mass political movements, for example, like the Taiping Rebellion, and that might undermine social or political stability. On the other hand, the state can also counteract that by they can curb the influence of religion on the society by, say, providing resources or public goods to promote political stability. So we believe that there's room for these two to interact in a way, uh, especially in the political arena, 
And uh, we think that that might have a consequence on, uh, on the society and also its development of its economy. And we're going to investigate this in the context of colonial uh, Korea. So let me provide a little bit more background on what was happening around the time. So uh, we're, this paper focuses particularly on Protestantism, uh, which we believe had a large influence on the political movement that we're going to talk about. So it was introduced to Korea in around uh, 1880, although there are also, um, there are also uh, studies showing that it might have been introduced earlier, but uh, officially it was uh, brought in, the, the religion was brought into Korea by uh, foreign missionaries. And only in a matter of about 30 years, it was pretty well established across the country. So in 1910, there were about uh, 0.2 million adherents of Korean Protestant churches by the time that uh, Japanese uh, annexed uh, Korea. So after the annexation for about 10 years, the colonial government had this oppressive military style ruling and uh, that uh, they suppressed uh, a lot of freedom and uh, political activities by Koreans and also religious activities. And that led to this uh, independence movement, which was uh, probably the most significant event that happened in Korea's colonial history. And we call it the March 1st movement because it started on March 1st, 1919. So it's, there's the estimates, it's, it has an estimated participants about 1 million, and there are uh, more than 900 recorded deaths related to these protests occurring uh, in the first two months of this movement. Um, and based on historical records, um, protestant, protestant leaders and churches played an important role in both the planning of this movement and also diffusion of protests across the country. And, um, but we don't think that there has been uh, enough quantitative evidence showing this. So that's going to be one of the goals of this paper, which is to provide some quantitative evidence suggesting that uh, Protestantism actually played an important role in the diffusion of the protests. So in the end, the March 1st movement did have a large impact on the colonial regime. So it first it replaced the, the governor general of the colonial government and also um, started a series of policy reforms. Uh, the, in particular, it also um, induced a rapid expansion of the state primary education program in Korea. So before the March 1st movement, there were less than 500 public primary schools. And that increases by, uh, that triples um, at the end of uh, 1920s. In terms of student enrollments, um, it increases by more than sixfold um, after the March 1st movement. So we believe that um, this independence movement was, uh, had a large influence on the policies that was uh, implemented by the, the colonial state uh, government. So uh, I won't talk much about the data here, although I'll do it uh, later, but let me just go over uh, briefly about the, the, the main findings. So we digitized data on religious institutions in Korea uh, starting from 1915, and then we combined that with uh, a public database on the protests that happened during the March 1st movement. So it's just basically uh, conducting a cross-sectional analysis across the townships we find a positive significant relationship between Protestant churches and political mobilization. So um, the estimates imply that a one standard deviation increase in Protestant churches at a township is associated with an increase in demonstrations by about 7% and also an increase in total participants uh, attending these protests by about 40%. Um, we also find that uh, none of the other religions that also had uh, probably significant uh, existence at that time doesn't show any uh, particular relationship with the political mobilization. So if anything, it's uh, Protestant churches that were uh, most uh, associated with uh, the March 1st movement. We extend this analysis by using a panel data on the protests um, and we do that to document some systematic spatial and temporal patterns of diffusion of protests. And doing that, we find that towns um, are four times more likely to participate in the protest uh, if half of nearby towns protested the day before. So in the lens of viewing these protests as a collective action problem, we, we believe that it's possible that uh, what was happening is there's probably some strategic complementarity 
going on between the towns uh, when making their decision to uh, participate in the protest. And in fact, if we zoom in and define the towns, whether they have a Protestant church or not, we find strong complementarity uh, in these protest activities only arising uh, between towns that have a Protestant church. In other words, if for towns that doesn't have any Protestant church, we don't find any increase in, prote in protest activities, even if the nearby towns are experiencing protest in, in the past days. So um, that's somewhat suggesting that uh, um, the, the protest diffused more actively through these uh, Protestant uh, religious networks. Finally, we try to provide some evidence on how these political mobilizations and how religion might have affected allocation of education resources. So uh, we have, we construct a panel data of public primary schools and uh, we combine it with the difference in difference in strategy. And our estimates suggest greater allocation of public primary schools to towns that had more protestant churches before the March 1st movement and also towns that had more protests that were specifically led by Christians. Okay, and then, um, so we suggest some potential mechanisms, although at this point we don't, we don't provide much uh, evidence, but uh, we do think that uh, largely we can divide the mechanism into two parts. One is from the supply side, the state had an incentive to provide education in the sense of nation buildings in order to hom homogenize and indoctrinate the Koreans with their empirical ide ideology. Another type of mechanism might be from the demand side. So pos it's possible that Protestants and maybe the towns that had more Protestants had a higher demand for education. So the state is in an effort to conciliate with the Protestants, maybe you know, they're providing more education uh, after the March 1st movement. But this is something that uh, is a work in progress. I'll be happy to discuss more about that in the Q&A section. Okay, so our study uh, 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 relates to three bodies of literature. The first is the literature on the economics of religion and how it affects uh, 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 economic development. Um, so there are a number of studies showing that religion can have a significant impact on human capital accumulation and also economic development. Um, but uh, there's also a growing literature showing how the state and religion uh, might interact with each other. So we believe our study uh, is most closely related to this, uh, a recent paper by Madden Lee and Chen, um, where they show that the Christian missionaries were one of the root causes of this national, uh, uh, this anti-colonial movement that happened in early 1900 in, 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 in the context of China. So uh, the key difference with our paper and theirs is um, in our setting, the Christians are actually the ones who are leading the anti-colonial movement, whereas in, in their paper, um, the anti-colonial movement is arising as an opposing force against the Christian missionaries. And uh, our, our paper also uh, goes one step further and shows uh, what the, how the state is responding to these anti-colonial movements that were led by, by Christians in the context of Korea. Um, so we, uh, our paper also relates to this literature on mass political movements. Um, so we can divide this literature into two parts. One is um, showing what are the important determinants of uh, participating in protests. So a paper by Chi Cheng um, shows that uh, um, cultural norms or Confucian norms was an uh, important determinant of, of participating in peasant rebellions. A uh, paper by Duel, um, also shows that transportation infrastructure was an important uh, channel through which uh, information about protests diffused in the context of colonial Korea. Uh, another uh, literature, uh, another uh, group of studies show how these political movements have an influence on social economic outcomes. We believe our study can contribute to both of these by showing that religion can also be an important determinant of participating in these mass political movements also how these movements can also influence uh, the state's policy and therefore affect uh, uh, education. Um, finally, uh, the paper uh, talks to the literature on a small literature, but uh, a literature that's I think gaining more interest, which shows that mass schooling or mass uh, education was an important uh, process for nation building. 
Um, so uh, a paper by Elisina and Cawthor show that um, even in uh, dictatorship regimes, uh, the dictator, uh, if politically uh, threatened, has incentive to provide education, state education. Um, uh, in that sense, I think our paper provides some quantitative evidence where um, the colonial regime uh, was threatened by this political uh, movement is expanding their state education policy in an effort to try to provide uh, more, more education, uh, which can help the process of nation building. Okay, so let me first start with providing a bit more background about this uh, political movement. Okay, so um, again, Protestantism was introduced roughly around uh, 18, uh, 1880 with the arrival of foreign missionaries, although there are reports that it started uh, at the uh, border with, uh, with China. Uh, the missionary work, importantly, was based on the principle of self-support of Korean Christians and local churches. So we have, uh, we view this, these Korean churches, not through the lens of foreign aid or foreign uh, efforts coming into intervening with Korean policy, but more as more of as the missionaries were uh, encouraging Koreans to um, build their own churches. So uh, most of these churches are funded by Koreans, the Korean communities. They also had to pay for their pastors and also buy their own books and nurture their own uh, Bible uh, groups. Um, so these were largely grassroots uh, and, and, and domestically grown uh, Korean uh, Christian organizations. Um, but after the Japanese annexation in 1910, so uh, interestingly, the foreign missionaries and also some of the Korean protestant leaders uh, actually sought a cooperative relationship with the Japanese colonial government. So uh, borrowing the words of the Board of Foreign Missions of the Pres Presbyterian Church in USA, so um, he claimed that the Japanese administration is far better than Korea, uh, would otherwise have had, and far better than Korea had under its own rule. So it's basically praising um, the, the Japanese administration. And also it goes on, he goes on to say that, uh, so this is basically a guide so uh, the official position of these missionary groups was um, they should, the Koreans should not uh, resist the Japanese administration. Uh, in fact, they should uh, cooperate with them uh, in the sense of the following. So what is the attitude of the missionaries toward the Japanese? Uh, loyal recognition is I believe the sound position. It is in accord with the example of Christ who loyally submitted himself and advised his apostles to submit themselves to a far worse government than the Japanese. And it is in line with the teaching of Paul in Romans. So uh, basically, they were saying that you know they should show loyalty to the Japanese government. So they, this was the official position, um, and also they encouraged the Korean church leaders to follow the the missionaries' position, and they discouraged any uh, resistance to the the colonial government. However, even if uh, this, even if even after these efforts by the, the Christian communities, the colonial government was concerned about the possibility that uh, these uh, protestant groups might be an important source of anti-Japanese resistance. So they actually enacted some of the oppressive, most oppressive and hostile policies uh, against the Korean Christians. Um, so there's this one event that actually uh, culminates this uh, policy. So in from 1911 to 1930, there was a conspiracy case called the 105 Men. So the government accused 105 men who turned out to be all uh, important Christian uh, Protestant and, and Protestant leaders of attempting to assassinate the governor general of Korea at that time. Later on, uh, there was no evidence that was, um, even though they were sentenced to jail, uh, in the end, the government wasn't able to provide any solid evidence, so they were all released. But um, this was one of the reasons why the overall Christian community was outraged by the response uh, of the colonial government. However, the government continued to put uh, Korean churches, on, churches under strict surveillance, and they also, every church that was opened needed official permission. So if they um, if there was any suspicion that the church was involved in, in a, any anti-Japanese resistance, then um, they, they didn't um, permit the church to open. Also, in the education sector, uh, the government prohibited any religious exercise in the education curriculum at, at, at all private and missionary schools. 
so there was a lot of oppression against uh, religious activities, in particular in, 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 in protest at Protestant churches. So uh, during the military reign era, in the first 10 years of the colonial period, the colonial government strictly regulated all political activities of Koreans. So uh, they weren't allowed to assemble, they weren't allowed to uh, publish, and also there was no free speech, of course. And they arrested many activists that were opposing to Japanese rule. Um, in response, and as a result, uh, several religious leaders started preparing a mass rally to call for national independence, so overall, in the end, there were 33 national representatives who were elected, and uh, almost half of them were protestant uh, church leaders. They signed a declaration of independence, and they distributed copies through their religious networks in late February. On March 1st, which was the planned date to, um, to gather and then declare this independence in front of a crowd, the, the representatives actually um, had these concerns about violent protests erupting. So after just an, uh, announcing the declaration, after declaring independence in front of a, a small area, they actually turned themselves into the police. So the actual planned activity didn't happen. However, since the, informa the information was already all distributed across the religious networks, the mass rallies actually did go on in the several major cities, including Seoul and Pyongyang. And it actually developed into a nationwide movement, which lasted for at least two months and uh, with an estimated 1 million participants and about uh, 934 uh, deaths that were related to, to these protests. So this is just showing the daily time series of the demonstrations and the participants. So most of the activities or protests are focused in the first two months. That's not because you know, the regime uh, um, succumbed to the, the demand by the protesters, but it because mostly because the demonstrations were, were met with heavy handed suppression. So um, uh, one of the examples was this incident called the, the Chamni massacre. So protests and riots happened at town markets. Also, there were reports about arson and destruction on Japanese property. So on April 15th, 1919, the Japanese soldiers ordered all male Christians into this church called the Jamni Methodist Church, and they started firing rifles and set the church on fire. And after that, they uh, went to uh, houses and killed all the families of the Christian leaders who were, you know, um, who were suspected to have led these uh, protests and riots, although they didn't uh, produce any evidence. So this is just one example showing the brutality of how these um, how, how the Japanese government dealt with some of these protests and riots. So this is also showing the religious affiliation uh, in the participation of the March 1st movement. So uh, among the almost 20,000 people who were arrested uh, for protesting during the March 1st movement, Protestants accounted for around 17% of all arrests. So that's for a single religion, that's the largest group. Considering that Protestants was only about 1.9% of the population at that time, it does um, it does uh, it does say that uh, Protestants were 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 heavily involved uh, compared to the average population in the March First movement. Okay, so um, the central ideology of the Japanese colonial. Uh, policy for education was assimilating Koreans to the empirical uh, ideology. So um, the, the, the public schools or the state schools provided uh, education on Japanese language, which had the longest instruction time among all the classes uh, of which they taught. So that it was about 12, 10 hours a week. They also provided moral education on loyalty and obedience to the Japanese empire. So um, the, the ordinance stipulates that the goal of the colonial education was to produce loyal and obedient empirical subjects. Okay. Um, however, prior to the March 1st movements, Koreans actually had very limited access to the state educations. So schools were largely segregated and Korean schools typically had shorter programs, four years relative to the, the Japanese primary schools, which uh, had a six year program. And most of the, the public schools were focused in major cities, um, possibly because they were targeting the elites. So in most rural areas, 
there is uh, no uh, public or no state education being provided. However, after the March, March 1st movement, the colonial government uh, starts a major reform in their primary education policy. So in the 1920s, the slogan was one school for every three townships. So we see that the number of public schools increases. So in, in the 1910s, it's mostly, uh, it's quite stable. But after that, if you look at the figure, the number of the student enrollment uh, increases rapidly after uh, 1920. And then in 1930s, the, the slogan was one school for every two townships. And then we see another rapid increase in the, the student enrollment in, in primary schools. So overall, there's almost about a, a, 20 per, a 20 fold increase in student enrollment in primary school um, uh, after uh, from 1912 to 1940s. In the same period, you can see that the number of the student enrollment in religious schools actually falls and, and, and it's pretty much the same for the informal village schools and most of them are seem to be shifting to uh, public schools. Okay, so um, next I'll move on to talking about the data. Um, so our first uh, data set is the religious facility data set. So we digitized it from the Japanese Colonial Gazette, which contains information on each religious facility's name, their religion, and within the religion, their uh, denomination. So for example, if it's uh, Christian, uh, the denomination would be uh, specifically the group, uh, the, the, the specific group of which the religion is under. Uh, so it also had address information, so we can uh, link each institution or facility to a specific township, and also the dates of entry and exit of each facility. Uh, overall, the, the Colonial Gazette is provided from 1915 to 1945. So far, we have digitized up to 1925. We have plans to uh, digitize uh, beyond that. So for each town and religion, uh, we count the number of facilities in 1918, which is right before the March 1st movement. So we don't use information after the, the protests um, for uh, the, the main analysis. So for example, to construct the, we construct the number of Protestant churches in a given town in 1918 by adding the, all the facilities that, are, that were uh, either Presbyterian or, or Methodist. And then we also do that for all the other major religions. So we separately have the number of uh, Catholic churches, the number of Buddhist temples, and also we have that uh, for Japanese Christian churches, Japanese Buddhism temples, and also Japanese Shinto shrines. Um, so one concern about this data set is it's an official data. So the facility had to report their existence to the Japanese government to be recorded in this Gazette. Um, fortunately for us, it was mandatory to report, uh, otherwise um, you would be arrested or jailed. Uh, however, if you know, your church is actually involved in some you know, uh, underground activity, maybe they might have incentive to not report. Um, so we cross-check the Gazette data on, we only have on Pres Presbyterian Church. We only have Presbyterian Church um, in, from an a independent source. So that's why we check it uh, using only the Presbyterian. So we obtained this book titled The Story of the Presbyterian Church of Chosen, which is um, which records uh, all the churches under that organization, which was the largest Presbyterian organization um, by a Korean church. And cross-checking the data, we find that, uh, in fact, the Colonial Gazette contains about 50% more, almost 50% 50, 50 more uh, uh, number of churches. Um, and also the number of churches don't seem to significantly change or either before or after the, the March 1st movement, suggesting that uh, if anything, there doesn't seem to be any selective strategic entry or exit into the official data uh, before and after the, the movement. So uh, we're a bit more confident of, of using this data set uh, as a result of this cross check. Okay, so we downloaded the, uh, the, the, the protest data from a public database that was released by the National Institute of Korean History. So it contains information on more than 2000 incidents of political demonstrations and activities during the March 1st movement. So for each incident, it provides information on its location, date and time, the type of activity, um, the estimated participants and, and, and death, 
and also some of the characteristics of the participants. So first we construct a cross-sectional data to match with the town level at the town level. So that would give us the number of incidents happening in that town throughout the March 1st movement. We also construct a township daily level panel data, which we're going to use to study the diffusion of the protest across the townships and also across the day. So uh, the maps just show the distribution of the Protestant churches in 1918 and also the, the political demonstrations happening during ha that happened during the March 1st movement. Um, so on the left side, you see that uh, Protestant churches that was actually quite distributed across the country. So it's not the case that they were all just uh, focused on the major cities, but it's actually qu quite widely dispersed um, across most of the most, most part of the country. Um, if you also look at the political demonstrations, um, we see that yes, there are more. There were more demonstrations in possibly the, the larger cities, but it is also quite largely dispersed. So um, it shows that the protests were successful in diffusing to different areas uh, across the country. Finally, so uh, we obtain if, uh, the uh, public primary school data set from digitizing the colonial government document called the school registry in Korea uh, for 11 years. So we have some missing years, but overall it covers the period from 1917 to 1934. So each volume lists the universe of formal schools. So it's going to leave out the village schools, the sadang from the data set. But it has uh, all the private and public schools that were formal, formal in Korea. So we have their school name, the address, the year and month of establishment, uh, also the duration of the program, along with the number of students, teachers, and uh, budget expenses for each school. We construct a panel data at the township year level. Uh, we also cross-check the school registry data with the annual statistical yearbook and it seems to be very closely matching. So we believe that the, uh, the school registry data uh, it doesn't have much uh, measurement error or, or, or noise. Uh, for the control variable at the township level, we uh, collect from various sources. So we have information about population in 1925. So there is no uh, population data at the township level before. So we're going to use this as a proxy for say population in 1918. Uh, we collect geographical information from various sources. So we have caloric suitability index, the Terran ruggedness index, uh, distance to water source coast. Uh, we also have area elevation. Um, to control for uh, infrastructure at the time of 1918, uh, we're going to use information that was collected by digitizing the 1 to 50,000 50, scale map of Korea. So we digitize the entire road network, also the railroad network to, so we have information about the distance to the nearest train station. Uh, we have information about post offices, telegraph offices, police office, uh, military barracks, prison markets. So we're going to use that as uh, important control for infrastructure uh, at, the, uh, at the township level. Uh, to control for historical estate capacity, uh, we have locations on Confucian schools or, or temples. Uh, these schools were built in towns that had uh, were probably the center of administration uh, early in the Joseon dynasty, which is about like 400, 500 years ago. So we believe that these might be uh, good uh, proxies to control for any historical uh, capacity occurring at, at the local level. Okay, so um, overall, the average town had about one Protestant church in 1918, uh, although the standard deviation is quite large, suggesting that there's a wide, uh, large variation across townships. Uh, compared to that, the other facilities are definitely smaller, uh, possibly because uh, the Protestant churches we're talking about here is not the, the mega type, mega church. It's not, these are large churches. There aren't large churches. Uh, these are possibly more that was a renovated version of the average household. So definitely we see more Protestant churches. Um, the, the average town, so the, the probability of an average town to protest at least once during the movement was about only uh, 0.4. The number of protests for an average town was about 0.9. So on average, it was more likely for a town to not protest at all than uh, have it, than protest. Uh, the, 
There are about 37 uh, per 1,000 population uh, number of people who are participating in these protests. And for every 1,000 participants, uh, there is about 0.4 uh, number of deaths uh, related to the protests. We do see an increase in the uh, large increase in number of public primary schools. So, for example, in 1917, in the the average town had about 0.1 public primary school. So only one in five townships had a, a public primary school. That, include, that increases to almost every township having at least one school by 1934. Okay, so let me move on to the uh, first empirical results. So uh, first, our goal is to document uh, a, a relationship between protestant churches and uh, their participation in political demonstrations. So we do that by estimating the following specification. So on the left-hand side, we have political activities in town I and county C. On the right-hand side, we have the number of protestant churches where, which we're going to transform with the log, natural log, because uh, the, the number of protestant churches are largely skewed to the left. Um, we also include controls for demographic and geographic controls, and also uh, gamma here is going to represent the infrastructure and state capacity controls. And for this cross-sectional analysis, we're going to include county fixed effects. Uh, of course, key concern here is going to be that the location of the protestant churches are endogenously determined. Uh, so uh, we first take a look at that by regressing the number of protestant churches on our set of control variables. So the first two columns uses a dummy variable for whether there was a protestant church in a town. The last two columns is going to use the log transformation of the number of towns, the number of protestant churches at a town. Um, and yeah, regardless of using a county fixed effect or not, we do see that some of the variables are positive predictors of protestant churches. So uh, population is a, uh, is a positive predictor of protestant church. Uh, the average caloric su suitability index also positively predicts uh, protestant church. Um, but then on, if we go down in the last column, uh, distance to near telegraph office and um, uh, number of prisons are, are possibly correlated with protestant churches. So in, in the rest of the analysis, uh, we're going to try to control for the, we're going to include these control variables, hoping that they would uh, um, they would somewhat uh, address some of the concerns of these uh, omitted variables, but of course, uh, we can't completely address that. So largely, we're going to focus on providing some um, anecdote and some uh, correlations between uh, the churches and also the, the political movement, at least for, for this part. Okay, so uh, this figure shows estimates from a bin scatter plot, including all the controls and, and the county fixed effects. So we do see a positive relationship. So uh, if a town has more protestant churches uh, in 1918, we do see the number of demonstrations during the March 1st movement to increase at a given town. So um, this is suggestive that um, there, there's a positive correlation uh, between protestantism and also uh, political mobilization. In, in, the, in this table, we show uh, the estimates from um, using OLS to uh, regress the R specification, our baseline specification. So the first two column uses a dummy variable for if the town ever protested during the March 1st movement. Um, the procession church positively predicts uh, engagement in the, the or mobilizing uh, political actions during the March 1st movement. If we use the outcome for a log of number of incidents, we also do find a positive relationship with uh, the number of protestant churches. Um, uh, we can also use, look at the outcome for the number of participants in the protest and also the death rate per thousand population. And throughout all the uh, different outcomes, protestant churches is a consistent and positive predictor of political events. However, we don't find any other other religions being a positive predictor of political mobilization. Uh, we also don't find the difference in the type of action that these uh, towns were engaging in the protest and also uh, government suppression. Uh, the suppression uh, that was enforced by the government didn't really differ across uh, whether it had a protestant church or not. Let me just show you this table. So then uh, you might question whether you know, these protests were actually led by Christians. So we have information about like who was, who was who, which religious group was leading the protest. 
So conditional on a town having a protest, we also look at um, the relationship between the number of, of protests led by each religious group and how that correlates to the religious facilities. And in fact, we do find that if a town had more protestant churches, they were more likely to see protests led by Christians. And um, we believe that this is largely uh, Protestants because uh, when we look at the correlation with the Catholic Church, uh, we don't find any correlation there. Okay, so uh, this is just suggesting that these protests are, are in fact led by Christians, and more moreover, uh, they might, it's likely that they're be, they're being led by uh, Protestants. Okay, so that's just cross-sectional evidence. Uh, so we want to expand this more into uh, uh, using the temporal and also the spatial variation. And that's largely driven by these figures. So if on March 1st, the protests only occurred in some of the major cities, right? Uh, this is possibly because the leaders were distributing their plans through their religious networks, which are probably also reaching these major cities. But just then, just three days later, we find that um, some of the areas that are surrounding these you know, major cities, we also see an incident of protest. Um, and it seems to be just growing, right? So two weeks after March 1st, uh, we see more number of protests arising across the country. So now it's reaching all the way to the top end of the country, to the top, to the bottom of the country. Four weeks later, it's basically, uh, it's growing even more and more. So this uh, motivates um, the investigation to look at how these protests might have diffused, especially in, in these local neighborhoods. So um, uh, to look at that, we're going to have you use panel data on protests at the daily level and try to ask two questions. First, how did protests diffuse across space and time at the local level? And we're also going to uh, look at whether Protestant churches played an important role in the diffusion of these protests. Uh, the empirical approach is to use the spatial temporal uh, variation in the data on protests covering 2,348 towns for 60 days, which is mainly when the protests were happening. And uh, we're going to combine this with the 1918 road network and also the elevation data to calculate the distances between uh, each of these towns. And then we're going to estimate a specification with temporal lags of protests from nearby towns. So here protest is going to be a vector indicating protest in town on day T. So we have N towns here. WK is an M by N row normalized weight matrix, which has a positive entry if the, the two towns are within a distance K. Okay, so we're going to try different distances to see how sensitive the results are. Uh, but overall, if a town has, if the two towns are within, say, 30 kilometers, then they're going to have a positive entry. We interact this, this matrix with the protest uh, vector. Uh, so overall, they're going to capture like the share of towns that are having a protest within a distance, uh, within a certain distance K. So, and uh, that's going to capture our temporal lag of protests that are happening around the nearby towns. Uh, we also control for the, the protests that are happening in their own township in the past days. Uh, we include a township fixed effect and also a date fixed effect. Uh, and we're also going to allow the date fixed effect to vary uh, at, by, by uh, cross counties. So uh, in the first two columns, we're going to set the distance to 30 kilometers. So two towns are, we define it as being a neighbor if they're within 30 kilometer distance. Um, so in the first column, we control, we include township fixed effect and date fixed effect. And we do find that you know, there seems to be a positive relationship of a town protesting on day T. If uh, there are more share, if there is a higher share of towns protesting in the three days before that. In the second column, we replace the day fixed effect with the county by day fixed effect, allowing the day fixed effect to be more uh, county specific. Um, and then that's going to absorb a lot of the variation. And as a result, we find that only the sh an increase in the share of towns that had a protest on the day before is a positive predictor of uh, a town protesting on day T. So in terms of the estimates, the average probability of a town protesting on day T is 
then uh, having a, um, increasing the share of talent by 50%. Uh, so going from no towns protesting to about half of the towns protesting on the day before, that's going to increase the probability of town protesting by, by about four times. So we believe that's economically, uh, that's a large uh, and significant magnitude. We can set the distance to 20 kilometers. The, re the, the results are qualitatively similar. Uh, the estimates are also very, very uh, similar to what we find in the first two columns. We also construct, we also show that the results are robust to, instead of using the distance, we can define the towns to be neighbors if they share a common border. And doing it that way, we also find that the share of towns that are contiguous is also, and protesting, that's also going to be a positive predictor of a town protesting on, on day T. So this somewhat addresses uh, the question that, you know, it does seem that protests are diffusing spatially and also temporarily. So it's spreading out across uh, and a town's probably of protesting is going to depend on whether their neighbors are protesting at all. But in order to look at the second question, which is what role did protestant churches or protestantism play? We designate the towns to whether depending on whether they had a protest or not, we're going to call a town a protestant town if they had a protestant church. We, we call a town a non-protestant town if they didn't have a protestant church. Okay, and then we're going to interact the town's own status as a protestant town or not with and divide the neighboring towns into two types. So a non-protestant town, the share of non-protestant towns that are protesting in the past three days, and also the share of protestant towns that are protesting in the past three days. So the, the idea here was by interacting the towns, whether the, the, the focal town has a protestant church or not, with the share of protestant towns that are protesting, we can try to see if there's any complementarity in their decisions to protest, which would be captured by this interaction term. And if you look at the, the last row in the bottom of the table, so that's reporting the estimate on the interaction between whether the town has a protestant church and the share of protestant towns nearby that are protesting in day T minus one. And the surprising result is that a lot of these diffusions of protests that are coming from the nearby towns seems to be happening when the town has a protestant church and also when the nearby when there are protests in nearby towns that also have a protestant church. So suggestive evidence that the protest decisions were largely complementarity within this protestant uh, religious network. Of course, there might be different um, explanation. For example, maybe the information was primarily flowing through this religious network. So it was more likely to protestant town to protest if there were more nearby towns who were uh, also responding to that information. But um, definitely we think that there's something interesting going on here. In the third column, we also include controls for, um, because these protestant towns might be correlated with some confounding factor. For example, maybe they were more likely to have train stations. Maybe they're more likely to have markets. So we include uh, the nearby towns that also have a train station and also the nearby towns that also have a market and repeat this exercise uh, by including them as controls and overall the estimates doesn't seem to, to change at all. So uh, our results are, are pretty much robust to um, controlling for other type of infrastructures, which might be also uh, predictive of, of having a protest. Okay, so next, moving on. So we think that, so as a result of these, the March 1st movement, uh, the colonial government and underwent some, uh, some significant policy reforms, uh, for example, allowing assembly of the public, uh, loosening some restrictions on publications and also loosening uh, restrictions on economic activities by Korean entrepreneurs. So, um, and on top of that, the government also expanded their public primary education sector under the slogan of one school for every three townships. So they wanted to provide a school for every three townships. Um, so then you might question, why would the state want to provide education at all after this type of rebellion? Maybe providing education is bad at all. Um, and there's this recent paper arguing that um, when rulers are threatened uh, politically, uh, they do have incentives to try to homogenize and indoctrinate their people. 
through providing state-controlled education. And, and, and I think that uh, is consistent with what the goal of the colonial education policy was during the colonial um, the period, which was to basically uh, homogenize or assimilate Koreans to Japanese so that they can have a more uh, obedient and loyal um, citizen. Okay, so the key question is then, uh, or related to our project is, did colonial government actually allocate more educational resources to Protestant towns or areas where there's a larger uh, presence of Protestantism? Uh, that might be because you know, um, the, throughout the, the March 1st movement, it seems that Protestant churches were more successful in mobilizing uh, these political movements. So it's possible that the colonial government views, viewed this, this Protestant group as a prote potential threat. So in order, as a response to this threat, they might have been providing more state controlled education to these towns and to these communities. So whether this, actually, this is actually true, we're going to explore uh, the following empirical uh, strategy. So we're going to use the panel data on public primary schools that were established from between 1917 to 1934. And we use a difference in difference in strategy. So uh, we have the schooling outcomes in town I in year T on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have the interaction between the number of Protestant churches in a given town. And um, in, uh, and in 1918, uh, we interact that with the dummy indicating whether the year is after the March 1st movement, uh, in particular in 1919. Uh, as a panel uh, data, we're going to include township fixed effects and also year fixed effects, where we also allow the year fixed effect to vary by across count counties. So the key identification assumption would be that um, the there should be a parallel counterfactual trend. So uh, after, so in the absence of the March first movement, um, the schooling outcome should be similar across the trend in the schooling outcome should be similar in towns that had more Protestant church relative to towns that had fewer Protestant church. Uh, we don't, we can't directly test that assumption. Uh, one possibility is to test that whether there are pre-trends. Um, so we're in the process of collecting more data before the, the, the March 1st movement in order to test that. Hopefully we do, at, at this point, we do include a number of control variables and also a, a number of, of time trends in order to try to address the concerns associated with, with this identification assumption. This is our main estimates. So uh, the outcome variable in panel A is going to be the number of public primary schools opening in, in, open in town I in a given year. Um, and in the first column, we only include the township fixed effect and then the year fixed effect. So the estimate is about 0 0.079. Uh, it's significant and also suggests a positive relationship between Protestant churches before the March 1st movement and also the, the, increase, the number of public primary schools after uh, 1922. Um, so then uh, in the second column, we replace the year fixed effect with the county year fixed effect. We believe this is a more parsimonious specification allowing for differences in year fixed, in the, the time fixed effects across the different counties. And if anything, the estimate, the magnitude is going to increase, although the statistical significance is similar to uh, what we find in the first column. Um, in the third column, we're going to include the, all our controls that are interacted with this post dummy. And our magnitude falls by a little bit more than half, uh, but the statistical, it's still statistically significant at the 5% level and, and, and positive. Um, so the interpretation here in, across both panel A and panel B is that uh, increase the if a town had more Protestant churches in 1918, it was more likely to receive uh, uh, educational resources after the March 1st movement by the colonial government in the form of state education. Okay, so in column four, we're going to be we include town specific linear trends in order to account for anything, any factors that were changing according to, to town specific factors in a linear fashion. In column five, we include town specific quadratic trends and overall uh, although we lose a lot of precision there, we find that the estimate, if anything, is larger than what we find in the third column and still statistically significant, um, hoping that it's going to suggest that the results are, are pretty robust to including these uh, this parsimonious set of controls. <laughs> 
What's interesting is we don't find anything similar to what we find with Protestant churches when we use uh, other religious institutions. So in this table, we include it all together, but even if we look at it separately, we don't find any consistent or interesting pattern arising when we use the other religious institutions, suggesting that you know, this, this expand, school expansion policy is something that's more relevant to uh, what was happening with uh, the Protestant church activities. Uh, the results are same uh, if you look at the outcome variable using the enrollment share. Uh, more generally, we can interact the procession churches with the, you know, the with ear dummies. So this is a more general specification here. So um, mostly during the 1920s, the coefficient estimates are positive uh, and statistically significant. We're actually missing a lot of ears here. We're, we're in the process of trying to find this missing data and include it in our analysis. So um, we didn't deliberately omit any of these years. It's just that we haven't found the data yet. Um, but after 1930, you do see a bit of a drop there happening. And that's because the government is now switching from the, the one school in every three township to one school in every township. Uh, and uh, they're expanding the, the education infrastructure to even towns uh, that weren't included in, in their first uh, policy in the 1920s. But more importantly, if we look at the coefficients before the March 1st movement, um, they're pretty much close to zero. So uh, we're hopeful that we're going to uh, collect more data before 1917, which we can use to test uh, possible pretrends occurring before the March 1st movement, which can uh, help uh, validate uh, our identification assumption. Okay, so to provide a little bit more substance to whether these protests, uh, whether uh, like whether these the association between protestant churches and public schools were driven by these this political movement. So because the political movement, the protests also have information about which group led this protest, we can actually look at the relationship, whether the protest led by a specific religious group is a significant predictor of the school expansion. So this is what we do here. So uh, at the town level, we have the number of protests and also the number of protests led by each religious group. So for example, if you look at the third column, the first estimate is the number of protests led by, um, which was led by a group that is not affiliated with any religion, uh, interacted with the post uh, March 1st movement dummy. Uh, which is showing that it's not predictive of any, the increase in public primary education. However, if you look at the coefficient estimate on the number of protests that was led by Christians, it, it, it is a positive and, and, and very strong predictor of the number of public primary schools. So in the previous table, we show that you know, there's a strong relationship between protestant churches and school expansion. This table is, show, is, is showing that this the, the key channel here might be through these protests that was led by these Christians and not through any other group um, that's affecting this, this uh, expansion of the education policy. And it's pretty consistent and uh, across the different specifications. Also, we can include the occupation and none of the occupations are significant uh, predictors of the school expansion. If we use the enrollment share, we basically find very similar results. Okay, so. Um, so, of course, uh, it, these are very pre pre preliminary results, so we still have to build on and provide more credible uh, credibility for the causal inference. But if, like, if there's a big if suggesting that, yes, protestant churches were successful in mobilizing these protests against the colonial government, and if the colonial government was responding to this anti-colonial movement by allocating more educational resources, then we can think about what's, what's next is like trying to identify and distinguish the potential mechanisms of why the government might want to be responding to and providing more education to these to these towns that had more protests. So one potential mechanism is uh, what is called as a nation building process. So they're providing these state educations to indoctrin indoctrinate and assimilate Koreans under the empirical ideology so that they can restore political stability in these areas. Another potential mechanism is that um, the government, the local governments uh, are providing education as a gesture of conciliation to these uh, protestants. 
which might have had higher demand for uh, modern education, for example. So basically, one is a story driven by the supply side saying that they wanted to change the behavior of um, and suppress resistance. The second mechanism is more of a demand side story where the you know, government is just trying to meet the demands that was raised by these protestants throughout the, 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 the movement. So we're still in a progress of collecting more data and trying to disting distinguish these different mechanisms. So if you have any ideas or suggestions on how we can do that, uh, I'd be uh, very um, enthusiastic to listen to, the, to your uh, suggestions. Okay, so uh, let me conclude. Um, so, uh, we, we provide some preliminary evidence to potentially suggest that Protestant churches uh, as, a, as a single religious group was a major contributor to the anti-colonial protest. Uh, so far, we think that uh, there was qualitative evidence establishing this fact. Uh, we provide probably one of the first quantitative evidence of religion being a major factor behind these mass political movements. Um, and we also provide some evidence that uh, it might these uh, it might have induced the colonial government to increase provision of state education, which was proportional to the number of Protestant churches. Um, and uh, indeed, we have to work more on uh, trying to establish the key mechanism there. But uh, we think uh, this is probably a, a promising first step into that direction. So for the next steps, uh, we're planning to uh, digitize more data using uh, additional school data and also religious facility data. Uh, but uh, first, we want to bring causality into the empirical framework by uh, basically providing more credibility with our causal inference techniques. And then we want to further explore the mechanisms behind the role of Protestant churches in the political mobilization. So was it diffusion of information through the religious network? Or are we looking at some type of strategic complementarity happening between the Protestant churches? We also want to look at the mechanism behind the government providing more steady education in these Protestant towns. Is it really nation building through a suppression or is it nation building through trying to conciliate the Protestants by providing more resources uh, to meet the demands of, for education by these uh, in, in these townships? Okay, so uh, that's all for I have for today. I'd be happy to uh, accept questions and also uh, listen to your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sang Yong. Now let's invite Professor Doc King from Muji University to discuss Sang Yong's presentation. Professor King. Um, hello, I'm Duel Kim. Um, Uh, 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 a yes. Hi, uh, I'm Dual Game, Myeongdi University, Seoul, Korea. Uh, well, uh, it's my great uh, honor and pleasure to be here and um, listen to Sang Yun's presentation. It is very fascinating work. Uh, well, I I'm working on March 1st movement issue, but um, uh, Sang Yun's work with his co-author is much, much better than mine. So I'm so uh, surprised and, uh, uh, and happy. Um, uh, let me be uh, as brief as possible uh, because the paper is, uh, when I received the manuscript, I found that the paper is still at a very preliminary uh, level. Uh, my comment is uh, uh, suggestive. Some part of it, um, I realized that I didn't fully understand the contents, but your presentation is very helpful to understand your work. Well, anyway, um, according to my understanding, the paper deals with the relation between religion, rebellion, and education. Um, he tried to examine two uh, parts, that is religion and education, and uh, religion and uh, rebellion, that is uh, much first movement, and uh, how religion matters for much first movement and then affects education. Uh, but uh, because uh, I wrote uh, somewhat weird word here, but what I try to say is because the paper is still at a very preliminary level, 
the these three variables are not well organized yet. That's what I try to say. Uh, please understand that. Uh, in uh, his uh, uh, analysis, he looked at the relation between religion and March 1st movement. And then at the second part, he looked at how March 1st movement affected supply of education. Uh, of course, he tried to combine them at the final regression. Anyway, so. Uh, my, I'd like to focus on two points. Uh, first one, uh, I fully understand that uh, why he focused on Protestantism and it is very relevant. However, uh, still he may want to work a little bit more. Uh, that's uh, this. Uh, out of 33 national representatives, um, 15, uh, 16 comes from Protestants, but 15 comes from Chondogyo. Uh, this is indigenous uh, religion in Korea. Uh, because of some reasons, uh, Buddhist and Confucianist didn't participate uh, actively in this uh, analysis. Uh, one question from all this analysis is why Oh, uh, this column comes from table one from his paper. Uh, he identified, it is very surprising that uh, every church in every town, but the number of Buddhist temple in town is zero. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, one possibility is uh, during the Joseon dynasty, Buddhist, Buddhism was suppressed. So many temples were built in the mountain. So it might not be counted in the data. But uh, I'm not sure how much uh, Buddhist temple were counted and reflected in the regression. That was my uh, uh, question. Uh, more uh, question is related to Chandogyo and Confucianists. Uh, in case of Chandogyo, as uh, if you are familiar with Korean history, they were the sources of uh, 1894 rebellion in Korea, right? And then uh, they were really a big uh, protestants, uh, protesters against the Japanese uh, occupation. Um, uh, I try to collect the temples of Chandogyo, uh, but it was not so successful. However, um, uh, my question is: If you have uh, the uh, Chandogyo temple data, and then if you combine them in the regression, what would be the result, right? Uh, I'm not uh, trying to say that you should do that. But anyway, this possibility should be considered uh, because they were really large uh, group. Uh, at the same time, another problem is uh, Confucianist. Uh, well, uh, speaker also mentioned the Sodang, that is traditional educational facility. I'm not sure whether the school includes uh, according to my understanding, your data does, uh, does not include Sodang, uh, the traditional uh, Korean uh, teaching facility where uh, the Chinese canons were taught, right? Until 1910s or 1920s, uh, Sodang was pretty prevalent. And according to many uh, descriptive uh, historical documents show that people in Sodang was also very active in protest. Uh, uh, protest. Uh, but this part was not uh, reflected well. Uh, that's, um, again, uh, I'm saying that your regression is pretty persuasive. Uh, Protestant church uh, played an important role. But if you put other uh, religion as a base, and uh, put a uh, Protestant church as a uh, dummy variable one, <laughs> then uh, it might not reflect the historical events fully. That's uh, what I'd like to say. Um, well, that's, that's one thing. Um, the other part, uh, well, uh, the speaker mentioned that uh, the, uh, Protestant church did not increase much after the 19, uh, the March 1st movement. Uh, if my understanding is correct, uh, then your regression 
it can be relevant. However, what about if Protestant church or uh, the believers increased after 1919? Then uh, would this uh, second regression uh, work well or not? That's my question. Um, so uh, in your regression, you put a uh, number of churches and distribution in 1918. But what about uh, the spread of church or increase of uh, Protestantism after the 1919? Uh, then uh, how would that affect the uh, establishment of schools? That's another uh, issue you may want to think about. Anyway, uh, these two points are what I'd like to say. Uh, well, this is fascinating work. I really uh, wish you good luck and thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim. So, Sang Yung, uh, would you like to respond now? Yeah, just I, I mean, very quickly, I guess. So first of all, uh, Professor Kim was being too humble. Um, I mean, he has a very interesting project going on, and um, I hope to yeah see more about more of his work um, on on the March First Movement. And also, again, my my apologies. Um, this so I, I said this before, but two weeks ago we didn't have any writing or draft at all. So this is all like very quickly uh, organized. So. I apologize if the draft wasn't very clear, and I hope that the, the, the presentation made some, some parts of it clear. So yeah, I think you mentioned the importance of like why we focus on Protestantism. Uh, so we thought that there is a reason to focus because if you look at the both the religious affiliation of the arrest data, the so Protestant group was the largest, one of the largest groups. Also, uh, almost half of the representatives were from um, from Protestant churches. So, you know, if you think about you know, protest diffusion and the, the political mobilization, we think that if anything, among the group, among the really different religious groups, probably Protestant group would have the most relevance. But I completely agree the importance of Chandogyo. So that was the second largest religious group being involved in the protest. And from their birth, they were anti-colonial, anti-foreign. Um, I, I couldn't find any, any data on Chondogyo. So I went through their websites trying to scrap any information about their locations. I couldn't find any. So in the end, I was also unsuccessful. If you know of any data set, I'd be very happy to include it in the analysis. Confucian scholars. So the, the, the data on Confucian scholars are at the county level. So I need data at the township level. So what I, what I actually did was, um, so um, we, we have the civil exam passer data and, we, and um, so there we have the family names and I can match that with this township level family clan data. So for each township level, I know like the, the fraction of family clans that have like this high elite status, like we, we can call them like confusion status. And I, include, I, in, I included them in the regression. So I didn't include it. The results I present, I, I don't have them. But as a just a check, I, I include those uh, as controls and in the family clans from from the civil exam, and I don't find the estimates to change much. So hopefully that's something uh, that's supporting. I also digitized the location of all the confusion schools called the Hangyo, and Hangyo was one of the central confusion institutions, at least in the early and mid Joseon era. Uh, we, we include them as controls and the results are still there. So hopefully that's going to address some of your concerns about the Confucian scholars. Sadang data, I don't have, uh, maybe your co-author, uh, Christopher has it. <laughs> I'll have to beg for it, but anyway, yeah. So yeah, Sadang was definitely an important source of primary education. But if you look at the time series I showed you at the very early uh, part of the presentation, the number of Sadang, student enrollment in Sadangs is falling fast, uh, basically because the colonial government was suppressing education at Sadang. So they were, um, uh, and they were encouraging Koreans to come to the state education schools. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that's one thing. And uh, we do have plans to collect more data on, on the religious facilities after March 1st movement. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll look at how um, Protestant churches are, or how the religious landscape is basically changing after the March 1st movement. We think that might be some, uh, another interesting question to explore. Thank, thank, you, yeah, thank you so much for the comments. Very, very, very helpful. Okay, great. Thank you, Sanyong. Thank you, Doc. Uh, 
Now let's uh, turn to uh, some questions from our audience. Uh, I would like to uh, first read a question from Professor David Mitch. Uh, let me read the question for you, Sanyo. Uh, very intriguing paper. Are you familiar with Go and the Park comparing impact of Japan's colonization on Korean versus Taiwan? And I recall they find that impact of colonization on primary schooling was stronger in Taiwan than Korea because of better collaboration between Taiwan's local elites uh, than Koreans, who were much more resistant. Their findings seem to go in opposite direction with yours. In this spirit, if there was so much Protestant resistance, would not the Protestant re resistors have tended to boycott the Japanese provided schools, thus offsetting the impact of more schools? Perhaps this suggests that your uh, conci uh, conciliatory mechanism was stronger? Right, so yeah, thank you for the question. So uh, we are aware of the Cohen Park paper. I do have to go back and, and read it again because I, I actually forgot um, this, that the, I, I wasn't aware that the findings go in the opposite direction. So I'll definitely do that. But regarding the question about if there's so much Protestant resistance, would not the Protestant uh, resistors have tended to boycott the Japanese private school? So that was one argument I was thinking about this conciliation story. So if the positive relationship we find with Protestant churches and increase in schools is in fact driven by the demand side story of conciliatory, um, then uh, it, it, it seems that it's rather unlikely to be driven by that if it's the case, because you know, if the Protestants would have been the ones who would boycott you know, the state education, they also had the missionary school. So if anything, they would try to attend missionary schools rather than the public education. So in that sense, um, I thought that it, it, it actually puts more weight on the first mechanism of nation building. Um, and so the, the increase in uh, state education was actually for the purpose of nation building rather than the conciliatory mechanism. Um, yeah, I hope, yeah. But yeah, I'll have to go back to their paper again. And, uh, but yeah, I am, I'm, I am aware that they have this study. Thanks. Well, so next question comes from one of our PhD students, uh, Mr. Xin Hao Li. Thanks for the presentation. Was there any extraterritorial right and center time that might be utilized by the Protestants or missionaries to protect themselves? And was there a spatial overlay of administrative centers and the location of Protestant churches? Right, so for the extraterritorial right, um... I believe some of the foreign missionaries might have had that, but as I said, the way that these missionary activities were laid out was um, they did have mission centers across the country, but the churches and the and the, and the Korean Christians were largely basically grassroots and uh, mostly domestic. So the churches were not in any way like operated or, or owned by these foreign missionaries. It was all just Korean church leaders. So if you look, if you think about these church or the, the Korean Protestants, they didn't have much protection. Um, uh, uh, the missionaries also, their official position was do not get involved in any uh, uh, domestic affairs between the colonial government and also the Protestants. So that was basically the official position of the missionaries. And uh, you can, if you look at the documents exchanged between the missionaries and their uh, bases in the US, um, you know, the U.S. are, like, they, they didn't intervene much in, 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 in these activities. Was there a spatial overlay of administrative centers? Um, yeah, for, so for that part, I do, I do control for this, like, historical uh, state capacity by, control, by including the, the, the Confucian schools or temples, which were historically the important, um, the center of local governance. Um, for the more local, for the Japanese colonial era administrative center, I include uh, uh, several controls like the post office. I also have data on the county office or the provincial offices, uh, including those, yeah, the, the estimates are, are basically what you saw. 
So um, I don't think that might be the source of, that might confound our, our results. Okay. But yeah, great question, yeah. Okay, more interesting questions came in. Uh, the next, uh, still from one of our PhD students, uh, Wanda Wang, was the increase in primary schools after uh, uh, much first movement possibly associated with improvement in overall economic environments and the colonizers might provide better financial and transportation infrastructures after uh, much first movement not sure whether relevant panel data can be found. Besides, is it possible to control for the impact of uh, Joseon Empire apart from controlling for Confucian temples or academies, which seems to be a bit indirect in measuring the historical regime's impacts? Thanks. So for the first question, um... I, I think so. Basically, the idea should be that you know, after the March First Movement, those towns that had a Protestant church grew faster than other towns, so that might have led to uh, increase in school. So I guess if if um, one possible way to look at it is population as a proxy for economic development. So we do have population data in 1925 and 1930. Maybe we can use that to look at the, the, the population growth rate and include it as a control, uh, which might possibly be, uh, so including that might control for some of these concerns about the improvement in economic conditions, which might be correlated with Protestant churches uh, before the March 1st movement. Uh, transportation infrastructure, um, I think dual has, a bit more data like on railroad network, right? And then more like pan at different time periods. Unfortunately, we only have for 1918. So uh, we, we can't actually look at that, uh, but yeah, um, um, it, it's something that we'll have to yeah think about uh, whether there was a more drastic improvement in transportation infrastructure. But even if that's the case, if, 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 if that's correlated with religion, that can also be like one way that the, the, the that the state government is, is responding to these political movements or, or, or to the religious group. So we are in fact planning to expand this to uh, beyond the education sector. Maybe, you know, they are also providing other resources in, in, in the form of public goods. Um, and, and that might actually, um, uh, although that might project a different story uh, rather than nation building. Uh, but yeah, that's something that we're planning to look at. Um, is it possible to control the impact of Joseon Empire? So like a historical, uh, apart from the Confucian temples. Um, I, I include the, the family clan information. So, so I, I include controls for elite family clan during the Joseon dynasty. So towns with more elite family clans, might that might be capturing some you know, historical um, factor there. Uh, the results uh, results are robust to including that. Um, yeah, basically there isn't much township level data coming from the Choson dynasty. I don't know. Uh, Dual would know better than me, but I couldn't find. <laughs> yeah, any fine level data. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll see what else I can do. But yeah, thank you, thank you so much for the questions, Wanda. Well, so for time limits, we have to uh, skip some. Uh, interesting questions. Now let's uh, let's pick the last two questions. One is from Catherine Barnes. For those of us who uh, who are less familiar with Korean history, its physical group protest, the primary form of protest at the time. Were there other vectors for protest? For example, financial activities, publication or journalism. Uh, influence on diplomacy or international frameworks that reflect different expressions of social discontents may be more or less effective and align with different religions? This is a great question. Um, honestly, it's something that I haven't deeply thought about, like activity, protesting at a different uh, forum. So, as far as I know, financial access by Koreans was very, very limited during the military rule. So um, banking basically wasn't, was almost, so the state bank was based almost only restricted to some of the Japanese entrepreneurs uh, or uh, co colonists. 
publication was restricted. Journalism was restricted. So uh, there were Korean publication of like newspapers, basically, to what I know, wasn't allowed during that time. So that was very difficult. Um, influence on diplomacy was possible. But again, like they were under the Japanese colonial government, which was somewhat internationally recognized. The, according to my sh short historical knowledge, the, the Japanese annexation of Korea was already recognized internationally by other governments like the US. So there was really little room for Koreans to go on the international stage and try to protest. However, however, the reason why we think the March 1st movement was one of the most significant events happening is it inspired, it actually led to an opening of another government in Shanghai. So the Korean, the legis, what we what we call as like the legitimate gov Korean government opened in Shanghai in April 1919, like just one month after the March 1st movement. And from there, they started trying to appeal to the international community and also engaging in these diplomatic policies. So that, that's the best I know of what was happening at the international stage. But otherwise, uh, domestically or uh, in, on the Korean peninsula, um, I don't think you know there was... Uh, many other activities that was happening uh, at that time. But yeah, so I have to look at this more. It's an a interesting question, yeah. Good. The last question from Chong Yong Wang. I have a quick question. Why didn't you distinguish primary schools for Japanese and the primary schools for Koreans? So the data we use are all just primary schools for Korean. We don't include any primary schools from Japanese. We think that that might be a possible way to do like, I don't know, some, some type of other diagnostic test using the, the school. We do have the school data on Japanese, but in our analysis, it's just all for, for Koreans because they were segregated at that time. Yeah, so thanks for the question, yeah. Okay, perfect. So the last minute, uh, Professor Chen, do you have any comments to add? Uh, thank you, Chuchan. Um, well, Diane's uh, talk is very interesting, and those uh, uh, comments also helped a lot. I just have uh, uh, two very quick uh, questions. Uh, one is the um, uh, uh, is about uh, the Protestant Church versus uh, Buddhism. Sorry, it's, uh, <laughs> oh, let me let me take care. Of Uh, sorry, I, I, I'm in a hotel room. Uh, okay, so um, because uh, Buddhism, I mean the Buddhist temples uh, and the uh, and and the religion, uh, Buddhism, are not so well organized socially at all. Uh, there are no rituals and so on. So, so in that sense, the the political dimension or political organizing dimension uh, for uh, Buddhism. Is almost non-existent, uh, but uh, the Sunday masses uh, with uh, the Christian churches, whether we're talking about the Catholic Church or Protestant Church, uh, are very much, uh, you know, uh, the main organizing uh, principle. Uh, so, so the political organizational dimension uh, of uh, monotheistic uh, religions, such as uh, the Christian Church is a very, very defining uh, characteristic. Uh, so you may want to um, emphasize uh, this uh, distinction uh, between the Protestant church and, uh, you know, uh, various uh, variants of uh, Buddhism and, and, and local uh, uh, folk religion uh, in Korea, because all the other ones are not so organized. Uh, so that's 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 one thing thing I want to bring up uh, when you uh, try to explain the, the results you find. Um, a second point is related to uh, my impression uh, on recent political movements and demonstrations in Korea. I mean, I have to say I've always been very impressed by the level of uh, intensity the Korean uh, demonstrators uh, of the last like twenty to thirty years. Uh, I've watched on TV. So do you think there is a lot of carryover uh, um, from the period uh, you are studying to the present day uh, South Korea? Yeah, thank you. <laughs>
Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Chen. Uh, time's out. Uh, thank you again for Sang Yong's excellent talk and uh, Professor Do Kim's excellent uh, uh, comments, and also the many que good questions from our audience. Uh, we are sorry for not taking all the questions here, but later we will forward all of, it, all of the remaining questions pro, uh, to Sang Yong uh, for his consideration. And finally, uh, next Thursday, our, uh, our webinar, our, uh, the speaker will be Professor Felipe uh, Valencia Casado from University of Br British Columbia uh, School of Economics. Uh, he will present his working paper in terms of the long-term impact of the conflicts in Laos. Let's look forward. Okay, thank you again. Bye. Thank you very much for the comments and questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Doc. Thank you.